Uh, so I would like to welcome everybody uh, today. My name is Ted Fisher. I direct the Vanderbilt Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, and we're very excited to start a new series, uh, Science in Latin America. We have a lot of interchange between social scientists and, and humanists uh, with our colleagues in Latin America, but less so in the hard sciences. And so at the urging of our class affiliated faculty member, Professor Gustavo Goldman, a microbiologist at the Universidade Sao Paulo, uh, we decided to start this new series and today is a pilot uh, of, of that. Uh, and the idea is to have more interchange around scientific discoveries between colleagues in Latin America and colleagues here in the United States. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Professor uh, Goldman uh, to introduce our speaker for today. Professor Goldman. Thank you very much. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, the Vanderbilt Evolutionary Studies Initiative and the Center for Latin American Studies. Uh, and of course, Ted, Anthony, and Larissa and all the other staff involved in the organization of this web seminar. I'm very glad to introduce you to Professor Pena. Professor Pena uh, graduated in medicine at the University Federal of Minas Gerais State in Brazil. He became a fellow of the Royal College of Physicians uh, of Canada in Pediatrics in 75 and obtained his PhD degree in human genetics at the University of Manitoba, Canada in 77. After one year of postdoctoral studies at the National Institutes of Medical Research in London, UK, he was appointed assistant professor in the Montreal Neurological Institute of McGill University in Montreal. He remained uh, there until uh, 1982 when he returned to Brazil as uh, assistant, as associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry from the same university, his uh, uh, University Federal of Minas Gerais. In uh, 1985, he uh, became professor in the same department. Uh, among his numerous uh, contributions, he uh, is the founder of Gene, a biotech company that provides clinical genetic service and DNA forensic diagnostics in Brazil. He's a, he's a pioneer in this area. He has more than 300 publications and, 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 and seven books. He was the president of the Brazilian Society of Biochemistry and Molecular Biology, the president of the Latin American Human Genome Program and member of the Council of the Human Genome Organization, Hugo. And he is a, a current member of the Brazilian Academy of Science and the World Academy of Science. He belongs to the editorial board of several uh, journals uh, uh, and uh, has been participating in the adv advisory committee of several scientific agencies in Brazil and abroad and has received uh, many prizes and medals. It's a, it's a great pleasure to have you here and thank you very much for accepting our invitation. Um, well, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, it's already 3 p.m. in Brazil, so I'm saying afternoon. For you, it's almost, you know, around lunchtime, I guess. Um, we're going to, uh, first of all, I would like to thank the kind invitation to uh, talk to you, to you folks at Vanderbilt. And um, uh, I uh, would like especially to thank Gustavo for his uh, very kind uh, intervention in making this possible. And I'm going to be talking about the evolution and genetic formation of Brazilians. In other words, how did the uh, present Brazilian people become the present Brazilian people uh, in the process of um, uh, genetic that admixture that uh, took five centuries. And um, uh, <clears throat> This, uh, if we're going to be talking about the genetic formation of Brazilians, actually, we have to go back something like 200,000 uh, uh, years. Um, sorry. And uh, um, as you know, mankind had uh, unique, these uh, dates here are keep changing every time you see a slide, they, they change the dates. But mankind had a, a unique and single origin in um, East uh, Africa around 200,000 years ago. And from there, 
it uh, migrated to uh, occupy uh, Asia, then Europe, and finally the Americas. And uh, in this, in every one of these migration processes, uh, there was a founder effect. In other words, the population that gave origin to the population that uh, resulted in that place uh, is smaller. So there are less founders and some lineages disappear. Now, uh, the fact that these lineages disappear make footsteps of mankind throughout the world. So it's easy from the genetic point of view, use special markers that can tell us who was where. Um, when I was a child, uh, this no longer occurs. Um, people had uh, their, their uh, traveling bags. And whenever they went to a hotel, the hotel would stick um, uh, uh, one uh, uh, propaganda there. And um, so whenever you looked at somebody's bag, you could see where that person had been in the world. And um, that's what we geneticists are doing, studying the present population of the world and trying to use genetic markers to decide who has been where. And uh, in that way, we can reconstitute the evolutionary past of humankind. And um, so the final journey of mankind to enter the Americas was the crossing of Beringia, which uh, was solid at that time. And so they went from Siberia to uh, what is today Alaska. And then they discovered uh, the, uh, the continent. And here uh, they discovered that the conditions were very mild. There was abundant fauna uh, to, uh, for hunting and uh, abundant flora. And uh, they could uh, populate so that when finally Colombo arrived here in 1492, there were probably circa 50 million people throughout the Americas. And um, in Brazil, the process took a little longer and uh, the uh, Europeans arrived in uh, 1500. Um, April 22, um, which was around the Easter of 1500. And I tried to use that to try to calculate when was carnival in 1500, but uh, I didn't get the exact dates. Anyway, um, and um, so when the Portuguese arrived here, they found the Amerindians, which were very populous. Uh, throughout the Brazilian coast. And, uh, and the uh, environment was wonderful. And they discovered another thing that the Portuguese fell in love with, which were the Amerindian women. And uh, so uh, soon after the discovery or the first arrival of the Portuguese in Brazil, uh, there was a letter that was sent to the King of Portugal on May 1, 1500, by Pedro Vaz and Caminha. And uh, the letter basically said, and one of those girls was dyed from top to bottom with that pigment. And she was so comely and so rounded and her private parts were so gracious and so free of hair that many women from our country seeing that would feel ashamed of not having theirs like that. In other words, like uh, a Brazilian sociologist Gilberto Freire said, the Portuguese were uh, sexually intoxicated with the Amerindia. So probably the first Brazilians, uh, truly Brazilians, were conceived between Portuguese men and uh, Amerindian women soon after the arrival of the Portuguese. Uh, and for several years, uh, we had this uh, asymmetry in that the male component was primarily Portuguese 
and the female component was mostly Amerindian. And um, in 1552, uh, a Portuguese priest who was the first, the head of the Jesuits in Brazil, sent to, to the King of Portugal, uh, complaining about the lack of Portuguese women so that men could marry and live apart from the sin in which they now live. So um, we can say that the first Brazilians were actually literally bastards between Portuguese men and Amerindian women. In uh, around 1515, started arriving, uh, not by their own will, being brought the um, African slaves to Brazil. And this uh, added a, a third component to the mixture. And uh, these Africans came from all over Africa. Um, but especially from Central Africa, what is today Angola and Congo and uh, Mozambique, uh, which is the, the uh, counter coast. And um, uh, the slaves coming from uh, Western Africa uh, were in much smaller numbers, um, you know, contrary to the US which has mostly slaves from uh, the west coast of Africa. And uh, these three ancestral roots coalesced to give origin to the Brazilian people. Okay, so I've given my talk and we can stop now. I'm joking. Uh, let's start by um, explaining how did this process uh, arrive and how did we discover how it arrived. Brazil, as you know, is a very large country, has almost continental uh, dimensions, and um, is, uh, at the moment, has about uh, 210 million people. And um, um, different parts of Brazil were colonized from uh, different parts, uh, from different people, and this creates uh, this, this graph actually shows that, but it's, it's a bit uh, uh, hard to understand this graph. This is the map of Brazil. And we see that if you look at the whole Brazilian population right now, uh, the Brazilian population is actually, we, we, we're not divided by um, uh, ancestry, but by color. Uh, the uh, census in Brazil is based on self-classified uh, skin color. And so the population of Brazil officially, uh, it, it's around 53% um, white, 6% black, and 38% brown, um, which is the intermediate color. Uh, this, has, this can change depending on the classification. Uh, if people use, instead of black, use the word um, Negro, that includes blacks and browns. And uh, the population is about half and half divided between whites and Negroes. Uh, I understand that um, some of the words that I use uh, and I use the official Brazilian words, uh, they are slightly different from uh, the common usage of these words in the uh, US. And uh, I hope at any moment, I do not stop being uh, uh, politically correct in that regard. And uh, so whenever, uh, when we started uh, trying to study uh, the origins of the population in Brazil, we had to sample uh, Brazil, this enormous country. So actually we did small samples from the north, that's the Amazonia region, where the Amazon forest is. Um, Pernambuco, which is a small state in the northeast, uh, mostly with African colonization because of the uh, cotton uh, plantations. 
Minas Gerais, which is the southeast where I live, where my university is. And finally, the southern part where uh, the climate is more temperate and where the Europeans uh, migrated to most of. And um, the first study that we did, we had to choose people to study and uh, use some criterion. And the criterion that we used was uh, self-recognized white disease. Uh, and we did this study to be finished at around 2000, which was the year of the arrival of the Europeans in Brazil. And we used what I call a phylogeographical approach. For those who are not geneticists, the uh, phylogeographical approach uh, may seem a bit puzzling at first because we don't actually study people, but we study lineages, lineages of people. And, um, but this can be very rich in terms of production. And uh, to study the phylogeography of people, we use what we call lineage markers. Lineage markers are uh, uniparental markers that come from one of the parents only. And there are two kinds, uh, the uh, Y chromosome for men. And uh, we all know uh, that uh, uh, maleness is passed through the Y chromosome, just like last name uh, also follows the same patrilineal lineage. And the mitochondrial DNA is passed from the mother through the cytoplasm of the ovum to all the children, uh, giving it then matter lineages. And uh, these markers are uniparental, haploid, and uh, non recombining. So they're very simple to study, given straight lineages, which is the phylogeographical approach. And um, along the years, uh, we have become, a, this is a very simple map from the time. And again, I'm going to be trying to use illustrations of the studies that we did at that time. Today, the situation is much more complex. And um, so we were already able, when uh, we did these studies in the late 90s, to recognize uh, Y chromosomal lineages coming from Africa especially the haplogroup E, and chromo Y chromosomal lineages coming from the Amerindians, which was the Q. And most of the other ones actually arrived in Brazil through Europeans. And um, so the first study that uh, we did was with men from the four different regions of Brazil, north, northeast, south, and southeast. And as a comparison group, we had some Northern Portuguese men. And when you do that study, you notice one thing, obviously, uh, that the haplogroup E, which comes from Africa, uh, the e, E3A, is actually very scarce. In the North, it's zero. In the all regions of Brazil, it's around 1% which is the same as around 2%, which is the same as Portuguese. So uh, the white men of Brazil do not have African Y chromosome mostly. The same thing happens to Q3, which is the Amerindian, uh, the Amerindian haplogroup. And uh, again, we have zero participation of Y Amerindians, uh, Y Amerindian chromosomes in the white uh, self-classified Brazilian groups. In other words, the Brazilian self-classified white is actually an European from the point of view of the Y chromosome. And actually, if you look at the profile of Brazil, and Portugal and uh, some other European countries, mostly Southern European countries, you're going to see that uh, the, uh, the profile is more or less the same. 
However, when we went to the mitochondrial DNA, which is the one that comes from the mother to the children and traces natural lineages. And again, we can separate European, Amerindian, and African uh, mitochondrial DNA. Uh, we're able to do that from uh, genetic typing. Uh, we found something very fascinating. In Brazil, white Brazilian women, or white Brazilians in, in general, sorry, have approximately one third Native American mitochondrial DNA. And I, I, my uh, mitochondrial DNA is Amerindian, have about a third African and a third European. And um, so this is a picture completely different from the male counterpart. And if you look at the regions, you see that uh, the data, although the numbers were small, and we're going to be seeing that this has been largely confirmed in later studies, that in northern Brazil, where we have a, a, a predominance of uh, Amerindian uh, roots, we have most of the mitochondrial DNA is of Native American origin. In the Northeast, where the African arrived, uh, were brought in for the cotton and cacao plantations uh, is the predominant haplogroup is African. And in Southern Brazil is uh, predominantly European. So uh, this makes a lot of uh, historical sense. And in uh, Brazilian Southeast, uh, we have about a third, a third, and a third. So, um, I think I got ahead of myself. If you look at the regions from Brazil, you can actually, actually trace the proportion of uh, mitochondrial, uh, uh, my, native mitochondrial lineages. For instance, I, I just said that the state of Minas Gerais in the southeast has about a third of the, of the mitochondrial DNA is of Amerindian origin. The south of Brazil, of European origin, I'm sorry. The south of Brazil has 66%. To go from Minas Gerais to south of Brazil, you have to go through the state of Sao Paulo. And if you now go and study white individuals from Sao Paulo, you're gonna be seeing that their uh, mitochondrial DNA is actually intermediate European in, in, in this case. Um, more interesting than that, we discovered that if you look, the first Brazilian census was made in 1872. And uh, in that census, they, uh, they, did, they classified people as colored, free colored and slaves. And uh, so we, we looked at the free colored compared to total whites in that, in that uh, sense. And here you have the log of the percentage of African mitochondrial DNA and the, uh, the data from the Brazilian census from 1872. And you see that's a straight line uh, that has uh, a very uh, significant P value, which shows that the trends that predominate in Brazil these days uh, about African uh, mitochondrial DNA already were prevailing in 1872, more than one century ago. <clears throat> the, um, so if you, if you look at uh, the uh, uh, composition of the uh, white individuals in Brazil, their mitochondrial DNA, their, their origins, the male origins are primarily European, came from the Portuguese, and the female origins came from the Amerindians and Africans. Uh, and this shows a very important 
sexual asymmetry in the contribution to the present day population of Brazil. Um, we can do the same study now looking at the counterpart. Instead of looking at self-classified white Brazilians, we can look now at Afro-Brazilians or self-classified black Brazilians. So uh, we use the same lineage markers. And, and now we have a picture that's completely different. While the mitochondrial DNA in whites from Brazil were predominantly, uh, well, one third, one third or one third were mixed. Now in the blacks, they are mostly from sub-Saharan Africa as expected. In second place from the Americas, uh, Amerindian and rarely European. In other words, the mitochondrial, mitochondrial DNA in blacks from Brazil come primarily from Africa as expected in a, in a direct succession. On the other hand, if we look at uh, the haplogroups of Y chromosomes, we see that um, the, there is a 52% of the Y chromosomes in Brazilian uh, blacks are not from Africa, are from other places, 48% are from Africa. So what we're seeing is the counterpart of what we had seen with the Brazilian whites. And um, this was largely confirmed in studies. Uh, we did this study in Sao Paulo, 85% mitochondrial DNA from Africa, 48% from the Y. And we also did studies in Rio de Janeiro and Porto Alegre with the same results confirming uh, the importance of these results. So, um, so there is evidence for historical sex bias mating in the Caucasian uh, population of Brazil and also in the black population of Brazil. And it's interesting that if we look at um, other places in uh, South America uh, and, uh, and uh, Latin America, we're going to be, see, be seeing similar phenomena that were replicated from our work, which was the first, and then was replicated by several other authors in Argentina, uh, in Chile, Colombia, Costa Rica. Uh, in all of these, there was a predominance of Amerindian mitochondrial DNA in whites uh, in, in, in the Caucasian population, and there was a predominance of uh, European Y chromosomes. So the sex bias genetic admixture seems to be an integral component of colonization processes and can be exploited as a tool to unravel the genetic demography of colonies. And uh, this is a study that we did a few years ago. And uh, basically uh, at uh, Angola, as you know, went through 30 years of uh, civil war. And um, we knew very little about the past of Angola. And um, we can actually now, using the phylogeographic approach, study the structure of the Angolan population using the mitochondrial DNA from African slaves that came from Angola 500 years ago. So we can reconstitute Angola 500 years ago by studying present day Brazilian population. And this is what we I call the phylogeographical approach. It's interesting that uh, and you may be asking yourselves, what would be the situation in the US? That um, a bit later, it was found that uh, really uh, male European and female African contributions were elevated in the genome of African American Indians. And um, so in, in other words, some of the same phenomenon could be seen in African-American individuals. And um, um, don't, uh, I, I think that's 
that's unreadable. So we decided to do a study to see what uh, the American themselves have not asked. And we took FBI uh, data, uh, 1400 uh, mitochondrial DNA sequences from white Americans. And we tried to classify them according to their hypergroup, hypergroups. And we yeah, to identify which ones were Amerindian and which ones were uh, African. And to, uh, I must say, not to our surprise, we found that actually in American whites, you do not see, you see proportions, very small proportions of um, African mitochondrial DNA and Amerindian mitochondrial DNA. Uh, our paper was published uh, in 2007. Um, that uh, there was sex bias gene flow in African Americans, but not in American Caucasians. And uh, this has been replicated by other authors later. This is a study that was published in uh, uh, 2015. And what this study shows is that um, African Americans have a predominance of African. Um, of African mitochondrial DNA. US Caucasians have almost no African US, uh, almost no African mitochondrial DNA. Funnily enough, if you go to US Hispanics, you start seeing a picture closer to that of uh, Latin America. And um, so what would be the reason for that, that the US Caucasians do not have, um, do not have any African mitochondrial DNA that uh, would be uh, phenotypically inert, like it is, for instance, in my case, that uh, I'm very white and cannot uh, burn, cannot even tan, and uh, have uh, Amerindian mitochondrial DNA, no phenotypic effect. Why not? For one reason, because if somebody is the offspring of a mating between a black woman and a white man in the US, he's not considered black, uh, he's not considered white, he's always considered black. So that's the reason why when you look at uh, American, uh, uh, American uh, uh, white individuals, you don't see uh, any mitochondrial DNA from Africa. Uh, that's one of the interpretations, of course. There may be others that uh, uh, I'm not aware of. So uh, the sexual asymmetry in uh, uh, genetic admixture is a generalized phenomenon. Uh, and, uh, but of course, it shows itself much uh, more or less uh, depending on how the racial classification is, is made. In Brazil, where the ratio or the uh, color classification is based on appearance and not on genealogy, uh, it, it is very clear. In a country like the US, where it's more based on genealogy, according to the hypodescendant descendant rules, uh, you have, uh, you don't have, you, you don't see it at all. So this is more or less the typical uh, situation of a farmer in Brazil. Here you have an individual who is an immigrant, probably, uh, who's white, and uh, his wife is uh, brown. His uh, mother-in-law is uh, very black, probably an African slave, and the children come in all different colors. Uh, different shades of between white, like this baby, and black, like this one. And of course, in Brazil, since appearance is more important than the genealogy, uh, this child would be considered white and this child would be considered black, which is a phenomenon that is not seen in the northern countries. Um, 
but uh, we uh, we were looking only at uniparental markers and not looking at the meridian markers at all. And we had our first chance to do this uh, when uh, there is a, a group in my university that's studying a disease called schistosomiasis in the northeast of our state in Brazil. And uh, uh, what and they took a, a small village and studied the whole population of the village. And we uh, were given small samples of this DNA and we could study that. And we studied that using what we call ancestry informative markers. And these ancestry informative markers are markers that have very different genetic frequencies in Africans and Europeans, and they can be used as African markers. And um, so here you see, for instance, uh, what we call the African index using these markers. This is Saint Tome Island, an island off the coast of West <coughs> Africa. And this is Northern Portugal. And you see that the difference between these two is about 20 logs which is the difference in size between a bacterium and a whale. And so when we took now the population of that city, Peixadinha, in the Northeast of our state, we see that individuals that are self-classified black, self-classified brown and self-classified white, there is very, uh, they all mixed completely, very different from what you see in São Tomé and Portugal. They are all very mixed. In other words, it doesn't matter um, what color they are, their ancestry is more or less the same, basically. Um, with the advance in uh, genetic methodology, we uh, develop a system that allowed us to be much more detailed in this. And these were insertion deletion polymorphisms that uh, we developed. And uh, what we did is that we first mapped 55 populations of the world. And uh, then we showed that we could group uh, using these uh, insertion deletion polymorphisms into an African group, an American group, and a mixed group, which you call the European group. And um, that way you can make what triangular graphs in, in which we have an European corner, an Amerindian corner, and an African corner. And you can now map Brazilians into that triangular graph. This here is the population of black individuals from the city of Sao Paulo. And you see that they range mostly, these are self-classified black individuals uh, from European ancestry and African ancestry, very little from the American corner. And they are all over the place. Uh, some uh, individuals uh, that are black have uh, mostly European ancestry, certain, and some of them have African ancestry as expected. Now, this is from the city of Sao Paulo. Now, if you take the city of Rio de Janeiro, which has, is in the same region of the country and has a similar profile, you see graphs that are almost like copies of each other. So these data are very reproducible. Um, so here is uh, Sao Paulo, and here is uh, Rio de Janeiro. Now these are white individuals, and you see that uh, now there is a shift towards European corner, but even white individuals from Sao Paulo and Rio will have, uh, some of them will have ancestry, which is, uh, African and some Amerindian. And uh, 
This is Minas Gerais, uh, where we are, I'm located. There's a more um, broad uh, genetic admixture. And if you look, for instance, from to South Brazil, you see that it's almost a completely uh, European ancestry, even though you still see individuals who are, who have a fair amount of African and Amerindian contribution. And um, then we decided to uh, repeat the study uh, of the regions of Brazil using again, uh, some individuals from the North, Northeast, Southeast and South, uh, but a larger number of individuals, 934. And um, again, uh, just to remind you, in, in census, uh, Brazil does not compute ancestry, only self-classified color, using a limited number of categories of skin color. And the categories of white, brown, and black are responsible for more than 99% of the Brazilian people. So now, for instance, if you take individuals who are self-classified as white, brown, and black, and each individual is a line in this graph, and green represents European ancestry, uh, black represents African ancestry, and red represents Amerindian ancestry. You see that it's very difficult uh, on a random order to distinguish uh, which one is white, brown, or black. In other words, the correlation between ancestry and color is weak. Here you, here you see the same thing, only decreasing order of European ancestry, but this graph is more dramatic because it shows very, very similar profiles between uh, white, brown, and black uh, populations in Brazil. Um, in the same study, we decided to ascertain whether um, if as expected from uh, historical uh, uh, data, the, uh, there is uh, marked differences between the different regions of Brazil. And um, these are not easy to see, but here you, what we did is that we took um, white, brown, and black individuals from the north, northeast, southeast, and south, and we did the ancestry calculations for them. And this graph, uh, I think every time I see this graph, it, this is the graph that uh, we tell our graduate students, don't try to use this graph in a talk, and then we go ahead and use it ourselves. But what we did is through uh, some statistical uh, witchcraft, uh, we could calculate color independent total ancestry of a region independent of the color of the individuals. And once we did the total ancestry of regions, we found that actually the, all the regions of Brazil, north, northeast, Southeast and South had actually very similar, uh, uh, very similar ancestries. And there is a reason for this, which is the fact that from 1972 to, sorry, 1872 to uh, the, eight, the 1950s, there was a big wave of, of European immigration to Brazil that brought almost 6 million Europeans to Brazil. So there was a washout and uh, all the regions became mostly European uh, in ancestry uh, with actually African components and Amerindian components, uh, which then reflect more the regions than the European ancestry themselves. Now, um, it's, it's interesting that uh, these data were very surprising to Brazil at the time, to the fact that uh, we published this <coughs> in a scientific journal. And to our surprise, uh, one of the Brazilians, Brazil's most important newspapers, Folha de São Paulo, actually made a call in the first page to our study 
showing that actually the regions of Brazil are about the same, which shows the interest of the people in general uh, in the science that we're making. And actually, this is something that scientists are not used to in general. Um, so when we look at Brazil now, depends where we are, we are looking at. Uni, uh, uh, uniparental or biparental um, ancestries. Uh, the, with the uniparental ancestries, uh, Amerindian, uh, European, and uh, uh, African ancestries are about the same in women, but when we look at nuclear, we see a predominance of, um, of uh, uh, European ancestry. <clears throat> Why then we have this difference between uniparental and uh, biparental uh, uh, markers? which are uh, recombined between husband and wife. And uh, this is my uh, drop of uh, uh, oil um, model. In uh, here you have a Amerindian uh, woman and she ob obviously, her whole genome is Amerindian and she has Amerindian mitochondrial DNA. Now, if that person marries a uh, Portuguese or another European, now the whole genome will be diluted to an intermediate color, um, but the mitochondrial DNA will be inherited intact. And in that sense, this person here has 100% in, uh, Amerindian DNA, but only 50% genome. And um, so if you do this for several generations, you can end up having uh, a Brazilian person who's basically uh, has the whole uh, genome uh, or most of 99.9% .9 of the genome uh, is of European origin and to have uh, uh, an Amerindian mitochondrial DNA, such is my case. Um, and uh, to, uh, I'm not gonna uh, go through much through the details of these slides, but just to show that to, for that model to work, you have to perpetuate the asymmetry. And here you have that uh, the population of Brazil in 1910. And you see that individuals who are Brazilian uh, were half and half male and female, while the foreigners were mostly male. Uh, sex of the Port Portuguese immigrants to Brazil, there is an excess of more than almost three to one male in respect to female, and that perpetuates the uh, sexual asymmetry. And finally, uh, this applies to all the other immigrant groups to Brazil, Italians, Portuguese, Spaniards, and even to uh, Japanese. Uh, in, um, in summary, um, Brazil is a mixture of Amerindian, European, and African uh, immigrants, but in a sexually asymmetric way, the uh, European contribution mostly from males and the um, African and Amerindian contribution mostly from females. Obviously, this is a story that is interesting from the scientific point of view, but is a bit disastrous from the social point of view, because what we're seeing here is a history of social exploitation and uh, sexual abuse uh, of the uh, 
uh, Amerindian and African females. So uh, uh, it's a sad fact. Conclusions. Uh, regardless of their skin color, the overwhelming majority of Brazilians have a significant degree of African ancestry, like I have. Regardless of their skin color, the overwhelming majority of Brazilians have a significant degree of European ancestry. And regardless of their skin color, a sizable proportion of Brazilians have a significant degree of Amer Amerindian ancestry. In other words, we are uh, really a mixture of three uh, groups. Thus, the only possible basis to deal with the genetic variation in Brazilians is on a person by person basis as individuals unique in their genome structure and in their life histories. Thank you very much. Um, I'm finished. Please. Thank you very much, Professor Pena. Uh, I believe I, I'm going to, to uh, address you a few questions that we have now. Uh, the first question is from uh, Leda Vieira. Uh, she's asking, we have two, for those of you who don't know very well the history of Brazil, we, the uh, Dutch invasion in northeast of Brazil in Pernambuco state was uh, the longest uh, foreign in invasion in Brazil, about 34 years of invasion. And Leda is asking, why do you choose Pernambuco as a representative state of the northeast in Brazil? Do you think the Dutch occupation could have an influence in the results? Well, um, the, uh, the answer to this question is an interesting question. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, actually, uh, we chose Pernambuco because we had access to DNA of people from Pernambuco. And um, uh, when you're doing uh, genetic research, you, 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 you study what you can, not what you wish necessarily. Although there is nothing wrong with Pernambuco, um, because you could have used the uh, Ceará or, uh, or uh, any other country, any other state from the south, from the Northeast. Now, it, the interesting part of this question is when we did our study with the Y chromosome, uh, in uh, our first study with the Y chromosome, we did find uh, two interesting things. One of them was that in, in Pernambuco, there was a slight statistically significant excess of Northern European Y chromosomes compared to uh, Portuguese Y chromosomes. And uh, this uh, is probably a small footprint of the, of the uh, of the uh, Dutch invasion of the Northeast. Uh, the numbers of the Dutch in the Northeast were not very large, but they left their small footprint. For the benefit of the Americans that don't know, uh, these Dutch individuals were uh, expulsed or, or thrown out of Brazil, and they moved north and founded New York. So uh, um, it's the same. Uh, group that uh, uh, is the origin of the Dutch in New York were those that were in Brazil, which were uh, commanded by Mauricio de Nassau. Um, the other uh, footprint that we found was a surprising one that in the Amazon, we found a slight excess of Jewish Y chromosomes. And um, and then we had to hit the history books to try to explain that. And we discovered that in fact, there was a wave of immigration from uh, some North African countries uh, to the Amazon uh, in, the, uh, uh, in the 17th and 18th century, which explained the slight excess of uh, the Y chromosome of North Africa, which is similar to the Jewish one. So uh, uh, the data is very, very sensitive to uh, fluctuations in uh, 
these types of populations. Okay, there are uh, more questions. Uh, uh, one from, uh, actually two from, uh, I'm sorry if I'm not saying correctly the name is Yada Ojada Ben Torres. Uh, the first questions are more genetical questions about how does the genetic evidence of sex bias gene flow fit or fit with or conflict with the idea of uh, mestizaje, mestizaje. Well, well, the word, uh, I try to use the word uh, mestizaje, uh, I try to, uh, because of, uh, I know that in, in the US, the word miscegenation is not, uh, reminds everybody of, uh, of the southern laws of uh, miscegenation, but um, genetic admixture uh, happens uh, and the, the fact that there is sexual asymmetry uh, from the autosomal point of view, it makes absolutely no difference, you know. So you have a, a genetic, you know, you have a, a wide genetic admixture, even though it is sex bias. The sex bias is an interesting part of the phenomenon. And um, actually I should have uh, um, mentioned this data, uh, I will now. In uh, very, very recently, a group in Brazil started studying the Brazilian genome, the genome of Brazilians. And they completed uh, 1,000 genomes of uh, random Brazilians. And uh, they, uh, their data uh, confirmed 100% uh, the sexual asymmetry that we see uh, with our data which were much more limited from the technological point of view because of the time that they were, that they were produced. Yeah, uh, there is another question from Jada. Uh, what is, the, uh, I think I can also add another question based on this question. What's your sense of uh, how public engagement with your work and genetic ancestry testing from commercial testing companies has changed the ways in which race or social identities are discussed in public settings throughout Brazil. I, I would like to add uh, the, you know, the man, the front page of the, for the Sao Paulo, I believe it was something like, who sees the colors, uh, does not see the genes, right? And uh, I would like to ask you uh, how you think uh, genetics or the Brazilian Society of Genetics or, you know, geneticists in Brazil they can help uh, to fight racism in Brazil by, by using your conclusions in this work? Uh, well, uh, you have to, there, there, um, there it, it's a complex way to, uh, to think. First, that um, uh, we're scientists. We're trying to describe, we're trying to describe what happened. Um, Racism is something that uh, has nothing to do with science in the sense that races do not exist from the scientific point of view. Races are socially, social constructs. And, uh, and as social constructs, they become immediately political constructs. And um, so uh, as, uh, as a scientist, my, uh, I try to describe, I do not try to prescribe. In other words, I do not try to uh, tell people what they should do about uh, racial classifications or not. I, and, and this now is my personal opinion, uh, I believe that we should have a, a raceless society, a society in which, you know, like Martin Luther King said, the color of the skin shouldn't matter. What should matter is the character of the person. And um, uh, so, but there are many, many, many uh, social and political uh, variables in this equation, uh, including the fact that um, what, for instance, Brazil and the US were very, had very separate uh, ideas about uh, racial structure of the society at some point. But today, because of uh, uh, the internet and uh, the facilities of communication, uh, some ideas spread 
rapidly. Uh, uh, like, uh, for instance, the um, the idea of uh, uh, giving opportunities, special opportunities to individuals who have uh, a history of slavery in their families, etc., uh, are or individuals who have a dark skin in Brazil uh, are more imitating the U.S. Uh, um, attitudes. So uh, it, this is, um, but again, I, uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be the scientist here and, and just simply try to describe the phenomena that I observe. I'll go ahead asking you till someone shouts and stop me. Uh, there is another question from Flavia Parra. It seems that you probably know her. Uh, she, this is just a comment. Uh, uh, I, I can, she said, I can remember as today in our Monday meeting, I was worried we couldn't find a relationship between color and genomic ancestry in our scostosomias uh, pa patients, you know. Professor, that was usually very strict, smiled and said, this is wonderful. Thank you, dear, brilliant professor, for opening our mind and teaching us how to be scientists. Okay, that's nice from Flavia. And, um, Thank uh, you, Flavia. Mm -hmm. Thank yeah, you for and this. Actually, Flavia was my graduate student, and she was the author of uh, a study that was published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science that uh, it's a very highly cited paper uh, showing the weak correlation between uh, color of the skin and ancestry in Brazil. There is a, an additional question from Jada Bentores. Uh, in certain African descended groups in the Caribbean, like Maroons in the Jamaica, there is evidence of African and indigenous Caribbean admixture. Has anyone done genetic studies with the descendants of Quilombo Maroons in Brazil? Uh, for those of you who, who don't know what is a quilombo, that is a kind of, um, you know, village uh, that uh, brought together all the slaves who escaped from the, the farms, you know. And then the question goes, uh, would you expect to see similar patterns of ancestry or maybe higher levels of indigenous American ancestry relative to other regions, groups in Brazil? Well, actually, um, we have very little data in that respect, and uh, we have not studied uh, quilombos. And uh, they're not easy to study because they're small groups and they're spread all over the country. And uh, there, there are political issues and, and all of that. But if you look at uh, our study of uh, Black individuals from Sao Paulo, when, uh, when we look at... Um, uh, their mitochondrial DNA. The, uh, the most common mitochondrial DNA, 85%, is African. And in second place, you have 12%, not European, Amerindian. And then only the European in the third place. So you see that there was <coughs> a much larger tendency for uh, if this can be used as an indication for uh, Amerindian and Black individuals to, uh, to, to admix. And um, uh, we know that actually in some of these quilombos, uh, they were joined by Amerindians. Uh, as we know that uh, in uh, the same phenomenon, phenomenon happen in, uh, in the US too, with some tribes of, uh, of Amerindians, uh, which were joined by run out, uh, slaves that had run from the plantations in the South and uh, uh, started living in some of the uh, tribes in, uh, in, in Florida, for instance. Um, and of course, there's people in the US that, uh, that know that a lot better than I can. I'm going to ask additional two questions and then I'm going to close the session because it's, going, it's running late. But uh, uh, there's a question from Luis Jabour. Uh, hi, I was wondering, do you know if Amerindian populations in Brazil are similar to black population 
populations when it comes to the sexual asymmetry of uh, mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome. Are there any tribes, perhaps more isolated, that manage to escape uh, between commas this phenomenon? Um, that's a very difficult person, uh, question to answer because um, the smaller a tribe becomes, the more uh, genetically uh, uh, similar it becomes. Some, uh, actually some tribes uh, that uh, live in the Amazon today uh, some uh, Suruis, for instance, they are more, if you look at a tribe, it's more like an extended family than a tribe because everybody is related to everybody. So these are very difficult questions to ask. Okay, the last question, that is a question from me, you know. You know, that's very controversial, uh, the dating of the America occupation. You know, it's, uh, there are a lot of uh, discussion about that. I, I would like to know your personal view about that. Uh, can you be a, bit, a little bit more explicit? Uh, I'm, I'm, think, I'm talking about uh, when the first humans arrived, for example, in South America. Uh, well, uh, I would say that uh, it is a contentious issue, uh, but there is almost a broad consensus that is something around 20,000. Uh, I would say that most geneticists do not go along with the idea that uh, you had a, a long-term occupation of more than 30,000 years, uh, like some groups maintain. But uh, this is an open issue uh, that uh, we'll have to do. I don't know how to solve that in the future. Uh, unfortunately, because of the second law of thermodynamics, it's very difficult to explain details of the past and uh, uh, some of them will be shrouded in history forever. Okay, I think we can, we can close the session. I don't know if Ted wants to say some words, but I just want to thank you, Professor. Very kind of you to spend uh, your time and give this talk. I think it's very important for us to, you know, to strengthen the relationship between US and, Amer and Brazilian scientists, you know, and I, I'm very glad you accepted our invitation. Thank you very much. And I simply want to echo uh, Gustavo, thank you so much, Professor Pena. That was illuminating. You were able to speak to both uh, fellow geneticists and those of us who aren't uh, in a way that's, that's very rare. Thank you, Gustavo, for your support of the center and for organizing this. And thanks also to Antonis Rokas and the uh, Evolutionary Studies Initiative at Vanderbilt. I think this was a great success as our pilot science in Latin America program. Uh, and for everyone who attended, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.